Uh, welcome to the beginning of our um, fourth Innovators Competition. And I am ready to go. I am so much in the mood. Um, Marla has laid out for me today to wear my shark tie. I've got sharks that are carrying, that's not schmutz, they're carrying briefcases, you know, so it's a very special tie. Also, I've been thinking a lot in the last hour and about incubators. My daughter-in-law just went into delivery uh, and will be four or five weeks early. And uh, so this is very, you know, successful launches is very much on my mind. Uh, and if you see Marlon and I run out the door, there'll be a very, I think, good excuse uh, for not staying with you throughout. And I think we're necessarily, I know we're necessarily going to have to miss the, um, uh, miss the evening uh, program, which I recommend to all of you. So um, just by way of background, it's great for us to continue in a Homeric oral tradition to continue the legend of Cube. The Center of Urban Business Entrepreneurship was founded four years ago in order to leverage the highly successful, outstanding, in the forefront um, business faculty and curriculum uh, that we have at the law school. Uh, it was also to take advantage of the fact that Brooklyn, you know, Silicon Valley is so yesterday. Brooklyn is, um, you know, this not only the center of the universe, but it is one of the global centers uh, of innovation and with businesses here and cachet, uh, we felt that there was an important unserved need to help prepare aspiring lawyers to know how to be lawyers for entrepreneurs. And it takes a different kind of chemistry, a different kind of language, a uh, different skill set. Uh, and we thought um, that that would be something that's very useful. And Cube has succeeded um, beyond our high expectations. We've already had several successful partnerships underway that are developing even further, um, including uh, work with the Keller Center uh, at Princeton's Engineering School, um, B. Amsterdam, Pratt's Brooklyn Fashion and Design Incubator, the New Labs Incubator and 1776 Incubator. Uh, and tomorrow, <clears throat> uh, I will be, I'm leaving late tonight, but tomorrow, uh, Jonathan Askin and um, John Rudikoff will be with me all day at RPI, the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, to talk about those kind of partnerships. And that's really incredible, because you've got these new ideas, engineers, who are producing tremendous uh, things that can serve consumers and the public and meet new demands. Um, but they lack, the one thing they lack, they've got outstanding engineering, but they lack legal support. And um, what is, the, in fact, the case in sort of the theme of CUBE is that it's important to have quality lawyers at the takeoff, not just the crash. Um, so they're very important and they provide outstanding uh, legal support for new and disruptive technologies. Uh, and then, the, in effect, the legal profession's clients of the future. So I really believe that our law school and CUBE, for all that it offers, is a go-to place for training uh, lawyers uh, to engage in this field to support innovative new businesses. Also, undoubtedly, many of our graduates will become entrepreneurs themselves and have their own businesses, as has long been the case. It's the case with some of our panelists, uh, or some of our judges. Um, but our primary focus is on training lawyers for this work. So um, this program here, um, is funded and founded by the Grossmans, uh, Stanley and Nancy. I don't see them here. I don't believe they're here. We expect them here. If you see Stanley and Nancy, please thank them when they come in. Please tell them that I gave them a shout out and explain to them uh, that I ran out to go to the hospital. Let them hang in suspense uh, for, for a little bit. Um, sounds more dramatic than it is. Uh, I also really thank our students who have engaged. I know that our students uh, who have participated in CUBE have gotten a lot out of it in many different ways. But the highlight of the year 
uh, for me is really seeing these ideas that our students prepare. We have a former winner I saw that came in the back uh, and uh, who's already been very successful and we have great expectations for what you'll be doing. Uh, I, I really appreciate and you know, please give a, a welcome to our distinguished judges, Caleb Capel, class of 81 from the, he's the CEO of the Bantam Group. Bob Manny, 77, he's the Senior Vice President, General uh, Counsel of Ultimate Software Group. We recently had the privilege of visiting his outstanding uh, operation in South Florida. It was incredibly impressive. I felt like I was, you know, on a spaceship someplace uh, walking through his uh, company. And uh, Jared Brenner, 15, is Jared, Jared's not here yet. Is he on the way or does he have to work again at Wilmer? Could not make it. Work again, okay, I'm gonna have to speak to him. <laughs> well, he's got his priorities. Jared is at, uh, he's a former winner, he's an um, associate at Wilmer Hale. I think he was just put on their associate executive committee. Uh, he is working on innovation type projects. He's incredibly busy, which is a healthy sign. As a young associate usually is, he's not yet the captain of his own schedule, so he's in constant demand, which is also a good thing. And frankly, he's probably making the right choice, although I'm never gonna admit that to him uh, by uh, staying and working for his clients. Uh, Professor Paul Gangzi is the founding executive director of CUBE and who teaches uh, entrepreneurship law. And Paul, uh, it's great to have you here uh, judging this uh, program. Um, we have a number of major supporters of CUBE, including uh, David Bars and Deborah Humphrey and Bob Cattell, who uh, are the, on the CUBE Advisory Committee, and a large number of faculty members who have participated both on a faculty advisory committee, but in, in providing the educational background. Um, Jonathan Askin, who is a man who deserves no introduction, no, it, uh, had, you know, requires no introduction. Uh, Professor uh, Bechtel, Professor Reese is on leave. Uh, our executive director, Jonathan Rudikoff. Did I miss anybody? I think, oh, oh, oh sorry, Mar Mar Marjorie White, who um, runs the CUBE Clinic. Who am I missing, anybody? What are you, Marla's like waving signals to me. Oh, and I'm getting there, I'm getting there. And um, Ben, yes, what am I doing, of course. Ben Rader is one of our judges also from Goldman Sachs, you see? Marla, every single day, you know, proves her weight in gold, which is not that much. So thank you for uh, reminding me of missing Ben, and uh, we're very glad to have Ben with us. Uh, so anyway, um, again, please join this CUBE team after um, the competition upstairs at Fricelli, where we'll be uh, taking a look at the urban agriculture developments, uh, which are really groundbreaking and very exciting. Uh, the bor borough president, Eric Adams is expected as our members of the New York City Council and there'll be several leading people in the field to participate so it's well worth uh, attending. And besides, it's raining like hell outside. There's no point going outside. Just go upstairs, have a glass of wine, relax and learn something new. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to Phil Weiss who's made this all possible. Thanks, Phil. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, first of all, gotta thank our judges for taking time out of their busy schedules for joining us today. So one more big round of applause for our judges. As Nick mentioned, my name is Phil Weiss. Uh, I'm adjunct faculty with the Q program. Um, I also s assist with the uh, seminars at Blip. Um, um, so what are we doing today? Um, this is a competition that challenges students to take everything they've learned. Um, over the last one, two, or three years, or four years. Um, throw it all away and come up with a venture that um, doesn't necessarily involve the practice of law. Um, rather, we're asking them to take a calculated risk. We're asking them to um, go out there, find a problem um, that exists in their limited experience in this field. Um, create a hypothesize a solution, research whether that solution is viable, um, and pitch it to our esteemed judges. Um, our judges are going to determine on a scale um, whether uh, our competitors are worthy of uh, a small grant to get their projects going over the next year. Um, and I'm going to work personally with these students over the next year to see that they make at least um, significant steps 
towards implementing the proposals they're making for you today. Um, our winners from last year are actually here, and they're going to present on uh, what they've been doing over the last year as well, so you can see um, the program um, and a little bit of how it works. Um, so what's at stake? Um, we have uh, two prizes to give out this evening. The winning team will receive $3,000 towards their venture, and the runner-up will receive $1,500 towards their venture. Um, so as far as scoring judges, um, you have five factors on your sheet. Um, we're going to be asking that you write a score from 1 to 10 on each factor, um, and then total the score for each team. So you'll have, uh, at minimum, uh, lowest score will be 5, highest score will be 50 uh, for each team. Um, the structure of the competition, each team is going to come up one at a time. Um, they'll have five minutes to pitch. I'm going to hold them to that five minutes, and we'll cut them off, cu cut them off at the five-minute mark. Um, from there, uh, the judges will have the opportunity to ask questions for approximately five minutes, um, if anything needs clarification. Um, I think that covers everything. Judges, do you have any questions? Any words of wisdom to our competitors? We're one to three on each of the categories. One to ten one on to ten. each category. So Five. best score is going to be fifty. Uh, perfect score will be fifty. Any questions from the competitors? Now's your last chance. Okay. All right, everyone. So we are going to kick right into it. Uh, our first team for this evening is File Fix. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this uh, rainy day. We are File Fix. My name is James Allen. And I'm Omar Mustafa. And we are building a research tool for tomorrow. Now, what we know is that legal tech is making the practice more efficient. And technology stands to impact many areas, such as legal research, e-discovery, professional education, and document automation. In order to stay competitive, lawyers need to be able to embrace this new technology, and that's exactly what FileFix aims to do. We provide seamless research and document storage through integration with the most popular business applications. So right now, conducting research tends to look something like this, where you have many tabs open across your browser, resulting in something that's cluttered and unorganized. And this can actually slow your computer down and even cause it to freeze. I personally have that open tab dilemma, uh, but I also choose to use bookmarks. So you see here, i am uh, got to go to BLS, then journal, and then whatever paper I'm writing on and scour through a whole bunch of clutter of resources that I may or may not use, some of them may be moot, and then get uh, over to my writing. And once you save your sources to your computer, it looks something like this, which is cumbersome to sort through and completely unworkable. What we want to do is provide a widget or an extension in every web browser and some of the most popular applications. So when you find a source, with one click, uh, you can file that and move on. The result would be auto-generated naming conventions for easier organization. And your naming convention categories can be preset to be by research date, by source type, by author, or really by any other convention that suits your personal preference. And FileFix will also provide other features to ease administrative burdens, like quotation recognition services, where it identifies your quotation and provides an auto-suggested recommended citation in the margins. Other administrative burdens that we uh, hope to ease for the users would be things like master source list generation. So a lot of times if you're doing an academic article or a note, you've got to uh, submit something like this for your editor along with the sources. It personally took me on the paper that I was uh, writing recently a full day just to do this and print all of the sources. That should have been time spent either writing or doing further research. So this is what our FileFix web page will look like. And as you can see up towards the top, there will be trending legal topics pulled from across the industry. And below that, you provide more specific research recommendations based on the work you are currently conducting. So we're really excited about the product. We're also really excited about how to grow the product. Um, and so with the earnings from the competition, we would obviously found the entity and uh, then pay a developer for the pilot and beta programs. Um, 
and we also want to be sure that it is spread far and wide. On college campuses, uh, this is something that we think students would find very useful. So we want to, uh, at least especially for the pilot and beta programs, have it available for free. And our premium service, which will be available through subscription, will provide additional features such as the quotation recognition, the master sources creation like you just saw, and the citations generated according to Blue Book legal standards. Another subscription service that we aim to have down the road once we've developed the product a little more is a service available, a subscription service available for businesses, so law firms, academic institutions. This would have all the tools that Omar just mentioned, as well as uh, collaborative uh, abilities for work product and further layers of security and encryption. And one day, Filefix will also be able to sell some anonymous user data, such as research trends, popular legal topics, and more. So we think that this is a product that is poised to grow organically, especially on college campuses and around law schools between students who are always looking to kind of crack down on how they can make research more efficient and more streamlined. Uh, so we do think that this will be a product that is apt for word of mouth buzz as well as some earned media also. And finally, Balthus will grow by seeking strategic partnerships in order to ensure that we provide the most efficient integrated research services for our users. Thank you. Thank you. Question? How, how are you going to charge for it, and what are you going to charge for it? So we do want it, especially early on, to be free during the pilot and beta program. And uh, with users at that point, we're going to really be focused on their feedback so we can be sure to develop it in an appropriate manner. Uh, there are services now, such as Quimby, that's, that students use, and that's $20 a month, and then some more extensions for $25, $30 a month. So that was our uh, price range. And the marketing? going to be done through it, word of mouth only? Uh, word of mouth originally, some earned media, and then we would, uh, as we developed the application, and we were sure that it could kind of be spread a little bit further outside of the pilot program, uh, market it through, it, through uh, paid media. And we do think that once we introduce this to law schools, that law students will really fall in love with this research product as it will really ease the process for them. And we think the product will actually grow with them as they go to law firms and so forth in their careers. And we want to also uh, make sure to grow it through strategic partnerships as well. So partnering with firms, uh, schools, and academic, or academic institutions, policy institutions as well. Isn't this a product that would be good for all computer users? Because everybody's got to clean up his or her files. Yes, and we actually want to be able to reach those users at some point. We want to start with the, uh, law students and academia because that's where we think our niche is really going to be. But one day we hope to really expand outward and hopefully tackle issues such as like fake news, which is such a concern to all of us. So we think that starting with law school, starting with law students is a great way to do this. As a tool in journalism, especially as a secondary market, um, for fact checking and as they submit articles to their editors as well. How have you compared this with existing uh, programs and existing uh, resources? Sure. So, and uh, there is there are similar applications, Dropbox, Pocket. These are things that are typically more so for um, news articles, and you can save YouTube videos. Uh, we're looking more at companies like Doxly, um, who are providing uh, file management and data man and document storage in the legal space. And using those other services like Pocket is really how we identify the problems that we want to fix. And one of those big things is integration. We want to be able to integrate these to your, have it on your computer, to have it across platforms like Google Chrome and et cetera. So identifying the problems with these other areas that we've used, we've been able to come up with FileFix. So FileFix would be integrated into those applications. So you could have a setting that says, save this file to my Dropbox or to my iCloud or directly to my desktop but it will always be available for you on the file fix portal. And those documents would also change in uniform. So any time you change something on file fix, it would change uh, in Dropbox or iCloud. So do you have any plans to protect the intellectual property or uh, other thoughts about what happens once this is out in the world? 
So primarily, we're going to be protected through trade secrets. We're going to make sure to keep our algorithms and our technology under lock and key and have strong employment agreements. But other than that, I think trade secret is the way to go with biotechs. And between us, uh, something, a primary reason why we want to form the entity is to assign the IP to the entity also, just so between the founders, you know. Thank you. Judges, if you'd like to take a minute to review the rubric and put down your scores. Um, up next will be Urban Ag Rooftops. All right, so my name is Will Davidson, and today I want to share with you my idea to take urban agriculture in New York City in a new direction that will tap into vast acres of rooftops that I like to call the new frontier where previous models could not. My idea is urban ag rooftops. Now, anybody who has ever flown into LaGuardia, JFK, or works in a high-rise building has witnessed the potential space on the rooftops in the city. I like to think of this potential like the early gold found in California that led to the gold rush or the unsettled land that led to westward expansion. The vast acres of unused flat land on the rooftops in New York City is a new frontier, and until recently, this new frontier has been unavailable due to strict zo city zoning ordinances and building codes, but times are changing. The large-scale commercial rooftop greenhouses in light industrial zones like Gotham Greens here are the first fort or settlement in this new frontier, and they are foundational because they show that the goal of surviving in this new land and new market is possible. What I'm proposing is to lead the way out of this settlement model like a scouting party and begin the process of harnessing this potential for the communities below by using the roofs to grow fresh local produce. The Zone Green Amendment of 2012 was the city opening the gate just a little bit to the brave, the bold, and the creative. And if we can start this project now, we will have a large head start on the next round of green amendments that will potentially open the floodgates to all. Now, out of the factors of this amendment, the no sleeping accommodations inside the building seems to be the trickiest one to deal with, but um, even yesterday I came up with the idea of partnering with CVS or Duane Reed or somebody that's on every corner of the city and in residential zones and they obviously don't have sleeping accommodations in them so their rooftops could be utilized. Um, so this is basically what it looks like. So the urban ag model utilizes the adaptable, customizable nature of smaller greenhouse pods that can be connected directly to the rooftop, they can be elevated on a frame, or they can be stacked on top of each other to fully harness the potential of all types of rooftops, no matter the size, shape, or amount of obstacles. The pods use hydroponic growing systems modeled after the current trend of converting metal shipping containers into grow pods. By using the vertical farming techniques of growing on stacked shelves, they can utilize the inner space efficiently and yield crops all year long. So in my model, the consumer signs up for a low cost produce membership that eventually I hope that they can pay for it with their SNAP benefits or other local food, food stamps. And they choose weekly or biweekly delivery options, the location of the delivery, and one of three sizes of produce to be delivered. Now, I like the idea of delivering with bike couriers because this will help younger people in need of work and promote a healthy lifestyle, but also the company will purchase electric scooters to allow older people to get outdoors, have an adventure, and create healthy social interactions while receiving a part-time wage. So, let's see, sorry, whoops. Um, this model brings many benefits to the community where it is located, and let me go back, and really just creates an overall atmosphere of improved wellness by bringing much needed attention to these low income areas in the form of healthy produce options and local jobs. 
So the initial startup plan is to accumulate around 1.1 million in seed funding from like-minded progressive angel investors that have a drive for bettering the environment. So out of that 1.1 million, 920,000 of that will go to the building materials needed for the initial 200 pods or 20,000 square feet, which is the initial push. Um, then the remaining 180,000 will be for rent uh, of the headquarters, employees, logistics, and a van. So this is based on the amount an acre would bring in. So at 20,000 square feet, this would return annually around $550,000. But this is if you're growing leafy green vegetables. So I'd like to leave you with this. What if you're growing a plant that was 100 times more valuable? The placement of urban ag pods has the potential to coincide with the legalization of cannabis in New York City, and getting in on the ground floor of that new market would make the model thrive. And that's all. Thank you. I don't want to go first every time, but I'm happy to if you want. Oh, I'll cut right to it. It seems to me that the initial uh, vegetable growing is just the way to get the system up and running to be ready for the cannabis. Uh, it, it could be seen like that, but my personal aim is for the, uh, the local produce for the community below, but it's just to throw out the fact that um, there is the potential for that aspect of this, build it, this business model, and even sort of transitioning where like a quarter of the pods grow the cannabis and the other three quarters grow the produce so that um, the system could survive and still bring the produce to the, uh, to the communities. So I personally am shooting for the produce, but I think the fact that this window is uh, opening up that as an entrepreneur, it's something to look at and take, possibly take advantage of. And why are you not looking at grocery stores and retailers? Um, that's a good question. I, I just sort of found that aspect of it to be a little bit, to add some specifics to it that I didn't find were necessary, as well as if you, do, if you deliver directly to the consumer, it seems to take a lot of the, the extra things that I don't really find necessary. And a lot of, it's, it's actually an idea that I got from some other entrepreneurial pursuits that are going on currently in Brooklyn, and they basically, they grow in a similar situation and then deliver directly to the consumer. So taking out the, the transport costs, the, the retail, basically taking out the retailers. And I just, while you're talking, I was saying, what about uh, health and other authorities inspecting the, product, the products? Um, so I hope to, with the seed money, I'm going to set up some sessions with Blue Planet Consulting, and they're basically a consulting firm that helps entrepreneurial pursuits like this. And th I mean, th with their help, uh, and also obviously just from getting with the health officials and people like that, I hope to really learn and understand to make sure obviously that it's up to all standards. Um, I, I just don't exactly know the standards yet, but I look, I look forward to getting there. Yeah, my, my questions have to do with economies of scale that you're maybe missing out on. I don't know if you've looked at the Gotham Greens model, but it seems like that, that's such a ideal system where you have the 20, you have the acre on top of the grocery store, supplying the grocery store. D um, inspection would be another area where economies of scale might hurt your approach. Um, ha have you thought about the kind of mechanics of getting, getting food from all of the pods together? Yeah, so that was basically, I s almost, so whenever I was researching this, I started off and I saw Gotham Greens and realized, I actually like took a week off. I was like, all right, like they're doing exactly what I want to do. So um, that was at first disheartening, but then I decided to continue. And so my idea is to use the smaller pods in sort of clusters um, to create the 20,000 square feet. And so obviously the systematic aspect of it is going to be the difficult part, like you said, the uh, the, the economic aspect of it or efficiency aspect because there's pods everywhere else. So one of the ideas I had was to hire people in the community so that it's not necessary to like travel, there's not much distance. These people in the community 
could go up on their own rooftops potentially, um, although the sleeping accommodations wouldn't allow for that. But like go to the nearest CVS, go check on the plants there, they report back to headquarters, and then um, even if the plants are distributed in that area, say the low, low income area, I don't think the transportation costs, like it could basically be somewhat in the community, goes up, you teach them to harness or harvest these plants, and they go take it to people around, around in their community. So I think involving the community that the clusters are placed in would at least help with the sort of travel time, the, the separation difficulty. How about the business and legal aspects of the rooftop owner? So you're going to go to the CVS, whoever it is, and you're going to rent space. How are you going to structure that? How are you going to kind of sell this to the rooftop owner if they're going to need be, need be inspections? You know, have you thought through the whole business and legal aspect of getting in, getting on the roofs and, and working through that with, with obviously many different owners since you're talking about a, a small pod, so to speak. So instead of having one large one, you've got four different owners, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to try and accomplish this. Have you thought through that? Uh, I have. And so basically, um, I would start with my new understanding. So this has basically been a crash course for me in all of this. But my new understanding is that uh, managerial companies really uh, make a lot of the buildings function, not necessarily the actual owners. So first, I would try to contact and get in touch with some of these managerial companies so that I would be able to possibly um, use their information to check out their rooftops. The other aspect that I wanted to say to answer your question is that there are a lot of incentives. So one of them is the tax, there's tax abatement programs pertaining to green roofs. Um, there's also extended roof life. There's a lot of environmental aspects. So I think there's enough incentives that, um, that I can't come up with, or I can't remember exactly right now, but there's incentives to get the rooftop um, people interested. And then whenever it comes to necessarily the contracts, um, they would just be sort of leased as a, like, a yearly rental basis, so. Have you thought, has your financial model taken into account the cost of leasing space on these roofs, doing construction on the roofs, which creates obviously issues for, for owners in terms of you know, damage and bonding and all that kind of things that go along with, you know, in essence, going on somebody else's property and, and undertaking a project, you know, construction project there? It does actually have that built into it. So the numbers that I'd run and come up with do have that built in. But I would say, to be honest, the weakness of my area is just my lack of understanding in insurance. And so I definitely think that's going to be where I'd start when I continue to pursue this is insurance. Um, but in my thinking, I th would start you know, comparing it to some sort of rooftop bar, because I think they have to have a sort of special, specialized insurance situation to have that many people up there and selling alcohol, um, I would sort of start with that type of insurance policy and then um, go from there. That's all we have time for. Well, I have two quick financing questions. Um, the million dollar seed money sounds like a could be a heavy lift at the start. Uh, and then secondly, uh, in your description of creation with local jobs, which is an exciting possibility, but you actually talk about having scouts, construction crews, specialists, headquarters staff, and so forth, and I'm wondering what you think the burn rate is and uh, how, you, how, how the business needs to develop in order to support that uh, personnel and infrastructure. <laughs> Could you explain what you mean by burn rate? Sorry. How much money do you need to get through every week? How much or money do we need to get through whatever. every week? Right. Um, how, how, how quickly are you going to use up that million dollars? I see, I see. Um, basically, what I would say is that the number that we have come up with for the 1.1 million is more so to get the initial push of 20,000 square feet and then continue that for around 18 months. That's sort of the only timeline that I've really come up with thus far. 
was that the 1.1 million was to get the initial push of 20,000 square feet and every all those aspects that you had talked about um, and then for around the 18 month mark to the 24 month mark um, that's sort of the only financial and have you done any research that um, supports um, collecting that 1.1 million <clears throat> Um, I'm not very experienced currently in that aspect, but again, I look forward to some intensive research to figure out the best ways to go about it. I think just the fact that the urban agriculture and the agricultural technology industry is sort of um, at this emerging industry stage, that I think it would not be too difficult to find investors who recognize that and also recognize that these systems are built to be sustainable and last a very long time and thus their future future revenues are seemingly just very positive. Okay. All right, up next, uh, process servers are us. Hello everyone, my name is Inga Smolyar and I'm the founder of ProServe Connect. Now, before I get started, can I see by a show of hands, how many here have ever needed to use a process server? Exactly, a good number of you have. And as such, you probably already know that it is not an easy task in the current market to find and engage a reliable and affordable process server. In fact, the current system requires lawyers as well as process server agencies to use archaic tools such as the phone, web forms, and word of mouth in order to find a process server. This is very manual, time consuming and inefficient, and costly. ProServe Connect will propel this connection between process servers and lawyers into the 21st century. ProServe Connect will provide the infrastructure that will enable a lawyer or even a process server agency to connect with the process server in real time and in ways that we currently connect in our everyday lives. There is currently nothing available in the marketplace that provides this type of infrastructure for the legal industry. The market for this is incredibly large. In addition to process server agencies, it includes all of the licensed lawyers in this room and around the country, as well as all of the future lawyers yet to be licensed. Just to give a sense of the market, there are currently over 1 million, 1 million lawyers in the US. 70% of them work for law firms with less than 10 lawyers. 48% are sole proprietors. Lawyers, as we know, practice law. And one of the main constitutional requirements is that appropriate notice is given when certain legal actions are taken. For example, in 2015 alone, just in New York, there were 22,000 evictions. CDC statistics show that over 1 million divorces took place nationwide that year. Guess what? All of these had to be served. The demand for process servers is high. The market is inefficient and the costs are high with a typical service of process costing anywhere between $45 to $100. Not to mention the opportunity cost associated with the time spent to find a process server. Based on these numbers, and assuming that 20% of the US population is engaged in some form of legal action, ProServe Connect estimates that the market is anywhere between three to six billion dollars. Even from a very conservative assumption of 5%, the estimate of the market would come out to one to $2 billion per year. ProServe Connect will initially focus on the B2B space, targeting small law firms as well as process server agencies in New York, with a second stage rollout to the rest of the US to follow. Our revenue expectations are based on a target capture of 10% of the market, which we plan to attain within three years of product launch. Customer acquisition will initially be based on agreements with process server agencies, the National Association of Professional Process Servers, as well as state bar associations, in order to have a population of beta testers that can help to cause a tipping point in the marketplace. We also plan on using Facebook, 
and LinkedIn to market the product directly to lawyers and process servers. Our revenue model is based on a fee that will be charged to both sides of the connection that ProServe Connect facilitates. ProServe Connect's goal is to create the infrastructure that will make the market more efficient and cost effective. ProServe Connect will mainly provide you, the lawyers, a fast, reliable, and inexpensive connection to a process server that fits your needs. There will be no need for web forms, waiting, or calling when trying to find a process server to serve a legal notice. No, you will be able to find one at a click of a button on a mobile app um, and you will have a list of available process servers in your area as well as the cost of the service dependent on your specific need. So please join me in revolutionizing this niche market in the legal arena. With your investment in ProServe Connect, we will first set up our LLC and then begin the development of a minimal viable product to start the process of bringing ProServe Connect to the market. Thank you. So you described um, a 5% engagement charge for the app utilization. Um, um, sure, so 5% um, initially the thought was to base it on the fee that the process server charges. So the range of fees is around 45 to $100. So if a process server charges $45, then the 5% would be split between the lawyer or the agency that engages the process, process server, so they would pay 2.5% of that fee, and the process server will pay the other 2.5% of the fee. So if I'm a small law firm, uh, how would you persuade me that the convenience of doing this on the app mm -hmm. is worth a 5% increase in the cost? To me. I mean, it's a question of time and how, how you would typically engage a process server. If you have a paralegal working for you or if you're just doing it yourself, if you charge $50, $100, $200 an hour, um, you know, I mean, I can do the numbers, but even if that saves you 15 minutes of time, paying 2% off of $45 should be worth it, even 2% off of $100, which is, you know, $2. <laughs> How are you going to do the collection of this from these, you know, both parties, and also from an intellectual property or trade secret? How are you going to protect this so that if you if the venture takes off the next week, Google's not in the business of uh, um, doing the same thing? Well, Google might just want to buy us, but um, um, no, that that's a fair question. You know, I, I think. I would look into um, somehow, I guess, making the code a trade secret, but also in the, in the agreements with um, the, the bar associations or the process servers, it would be baked into the agreements, like confidentiality agreements and whatnot, non-competition, non-competitor non agreements. And how are you gonna market this in terms of getting to, let's talk about the first stage of getting to the small law firms and getting them to sign up. Right, so from my perspective, the first stage would be to connect with the National Association of Process Servers. They have over 2,000 process servers around the country. Um, they also obviously work with a lot of lawyers. So we'd be going down that path, working with that association and with the lawyers that you know typically use that association, as well as with state bar associations, really marketing it to lawyers um, at events of state bar associations to get them to, you know, take it on and use the product. Well, I have a comment and a question. One is no one's ever had a problem serving me, um, <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. The, the second thing is, I mean, it almost sounds like it's modeled on Uber to a degree because you're sourcing and then but the difference is I guess you then have to send the, pro the papers to be served out via email or? Right, so that's not an aspect that this app would take care of. So this app, sole purpose is the connection aspect. Like how do you find a fast, reliable process server, 
Right now, there's no real-time solution for that. You know, I tried that. that this is this is how this baby was born in a way. I actually needed a process server. Um, you know, I thought I could do something on my own. Next step was the process server. I spent an hour, you know, on, online trying to find one, and I basically ended up spending $500 on a lawyer just to have them take care of it for me. Um, but but that's, it's really focused on the connection aspect. And what licenses would you need for this business? So because it's only focused on the connection aspect, you do not actually need a license for it. Um, so yes, lawyers are regulated, process servers are regulated. It's kind of the connector of two regulated industries. Um, so you don't really need a license for it per se. In my research, it seems like you know it might fall under like a money transmitter under certain regulations, but in my research, it, I didn't say that you need a license to actually do that. How long would it take you to develop the product? Um, so I haven't actually spoken to developers as of yet, but in my projections, I was giving it a year for product development. Obviously, if I find a really good developer, it might take six months, so I'm told. All right, thank you. Again. Thank you. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, Project Sit Soleil. Welcome everybody, my name is Antoine Kennedy. I'm a part of Team Kennedy SA, and my venture is called Project Sit Soleil, which is an online Haitian fashion st uh, store and gallery. The problem that the venture seeks to alleviate is gender inequality in Sit Soleil Haiti by providing an avenue for female empowerment through fashion, international trade, and ownership. In Haiti, gender inequality, extreme poverty, um, in addition to a lack of opportunities, coupled with language barriers to trade, plague not only Site Soleil, but also Haiti. And although the Haitian constitution protects women's rights, they have equal rights, in reality, that doesn't happen. And they're often abused, harassed, um, excluded, and are less educated, and very few enter into business. Further complicating the extreme poverty issue is the language barrier. In Haiti, the majority speak Haitian Creole, which does an effective job of preventing them from um, trading with their neighbors who speak Spanish, English, and Portuguese. And that's where the solution comes in, PCS, Pro uh, Project Site Soleil, and through the online web store, we're giving the women of Haiti an avenue to showcase their design skills through fashion. In addition, the venture seeks to send once a year law students to Haiti to teach English, business, and legal skills to women. In addition, the behind the website is the corporate structure um, of a benefit corporation. And that was chosen for a number of reasons. Uh, one is to gain the prestige of becoming a certified B Corp along with um, transparency for potential investors and also the opportunity for the women that are designing these products to become shareholders within the corporation. This is a, a schematic of the website where the ladies, they can showcase their fashions. There's also a section for advertising as well. In addition, um, customers can come onto the website from all around the world, purchase the items and have the, the items delivered to their door. Initially, 75% of the proceeds will be returned back to the artist. However, as the revenue advertising increases, the talent is able to receive up to 100% of the profits, and including their distributions of net income through their share of ownership in the company. Additional um, advertising sources that I have in mind for the venture include retail stores, um, wine and cheese type places, art supply stores, and others. And as far as the market, there are other organizations, pretty much most of them are nonprofits that allow Haitians to sell their artwork over the internet. Um, and these proceeds benefit the organization along with the artist. The difference here with PCS is the New York market approach, building off the art scene. There's the Garment District, we have New York Fashion Week, which is another um, thing that the venture would like to do as well. And that is to sponsor an artist to come up to Fashion Week and promote 
their brand, as long as also promote the corporation as well. Um, and also, our uh, additional um, thing that makes us stand out is the impact study as part of being B certified. And that also shows our transparency and what effect what we're doing is having not only in Site Soleil, but the trickle down effect within all of Haiti. As far as implementation, that begins with my own personal network. Um, coming from South Florida, I've had the opportunity to, um, to meet people who not only speak Creole, but also have ties there, including my extended church family. Um, they're going to be the ones that are going to help me facilitate and make these connections while I'm there in Haiti. Um, from that point, I'll find between five to ten local talent to start, build a website, find advertisers, and then facilitate the movement of goods. And that's how I plan to empower the women of Site Soleil and Haiti. Thank you. Some simple economic questions in terms of how much does it cost to get this rolling, so to speak, and how do you see the income projections? Sure. And where's the income coming from, and how much, and what percentage is advertising? Are you getting a cut of the sales price, or how does, how does uh, that work? Sure. So the proceeds are going to come from the sales of the designs. Um, so depending on the, the talent, I may end up with um, dresses, hats, belts, accessories. Um, so 75% of the net proceeds goes to the artist and then 25% goes back to the corporation. Um, initial estimates for startup cost is is actually about, um, about $1,600. And that includes um, things like travel, passport, corporate filings, um, getting the website up and up off the ground. I've experienced building websites, so I can handle a lot of those things myself. And I've also had experience filing corporate tax uh, documents, such as the 1120, the K-1s. Um, so in the introduction part, I can handle a lot of the back work. And then as things grow, I'd hire um, accountants and CPAs to, to take that off my hands. Um, and I'm estimating for the first year, to have about 48,000 in sales, and that would give me about 12,000 in revenue. And that's not including the advertising, which I project for the first year to be about 8,000. And then from there, we'll grow sales about 20% per year and advertising about 35% per year as um, brand recognition gets out there. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the law student component. Um, you talked about law students who would come once a year and then would teach basically English as a second language, uh, legal skills, and business, which seems like a tall order for law students. Yes. Uh, so once a year, we'll, you know, I'll go to my own personal network again um, to find law students that have these skills on hand um, to go down there and, and teach. Um, the main thing is that we want to empower the women there with these skills because traditionally they've not had these opportunities. Um, and then I've also read, when I was doing my research, that um, there's like a whole, a lot of history that goes behind it, but the short story, the short story is, is that Haitian Creole and their language speaking French on that island has isolated them from the Western Hemisphere. So they don't have the opportunities to trade and, and go out with their skills to the rest of the world. It's a lot more harder for them to do that. And so with the venture, um, being able to help them achieve that second language, I think would be a benefit for those people to help take whatever skills they have there and be able to branch out with them as well. Have you, have you looked at similar um, B Corps or other um, entrepreneurs that have tried similar things, maybe social, social impact investors or, or other um, women entrepreneur initiatives that are doing similar things? I found several organizations. Um, so there's the nonprofit section, and then there's the um, the uh, the for-profit sector. So on the nonprofit side, it's generally they are um, the main items that they sell in the art category are things like painting, um, tin work. I haven't found any for fashion. Um, actually, I found one recently, and it's a nonprofit. 
I haven't found any B Corp as of yet that does this. Um, and then on the for-profit side, um, usually they'll sell Haitian branded goods. So they're not necessarily made by Haitians, but they are branded that way. So at the end of the day, we don't know where that money is going and if it's going back to the communities or back to Haiti to, to benefit the actual people that are there or the trickle down effect. And that's the reason why I added the, the, the lawyers coming back down as well. And that way we can not only see what the artists are doing with, the, with their, um, their revenue to impact the community, but we also get to see what our skills that we're bringing to them, how those skills also impact the community as well. How does your structure and your plan fit in the world of Etsy? If I'm not mistaken with Etsy, uh, they are a hodgepodge of different products. Um, whereas this, we're just focusing strictly on Haiti and Site Soleil. So we're more, we're more of a niche market. And your, uh, how would you uh, encourage participation in your market as opposed to uh, admittedly a hodgepodge, but a hodgepodge which probably includes Haitian products? Um, there's uh, several ways for that. So one of them is ownership in the corporation. So each talent is getting a share of stock within the corporation. Um, and depending on how big things grow, um, they are going to receive that residual income. Um, so that's one thing. In order to get that, they have to sign an exclusive contract for X number of terms. And I haven't figured out the number of terms to where we are the sole source of where they market their products because we want them to stay and help be a part of what we're trying to do for Haiti. One big round of applause for all of our competitors. And another big round of applause for our judges. Uh, so here's what's going to happen now. Um, I'm going to escort the judges upstairs where we're going to deliberate. Uh, we are going to announce the winners upstairs at the beginning of the panel. Um, on urban agriculture. Um, so we'll see you there. Um, while that is happening, uh, last year's winners are actually going to come up and present, talk about what they've been working on for the past year. So stick around, stay where you are. Um, I'm going to hand it off to uh, John Rudikoff, who is going to handle it from here. Judges, uh, you all can come with me. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so this is, this is a really fun part of the afternoon where we get to hear from the teams that competed and succeeded last year. We get to see what kind of progress they've made. Uh, competitors keep an eye on, on their performances because some of you will be delivering the same next year. Uh, first up, we're going to hear from Drip Snip. Uh, they came in third place last year and uh, excited to hear about uh, how, how their work has evolved since then. So Drip Snip. Congratulations. Um, it was really interesting seeing your presentations, and I look forward, me and Mel and Brandon, look forward to seeing your ventures grow. Okay, so just start off, we placed third last year in the Innovators competition and with our venture, DripSnip. So, DripSnip um, basically had two avenues. Our missions were first <coughs> to um, help out low-income families by reducing their monthly bills or quarterly bills. And to basically, there's a big issue with water conservation, so to address that issue. And now, we realize it's very difficult to build an app, it's very difficult to build a shower head, it's very difficult to do many of the things we were planning. So we wanted to make an impact from the start. So we realized just by installing an EPA-approved shower head in a low-income person's family, in low-income family shower, that could reduce their water consumption and save them close to $70 a year. And that would make an impact from the start. And Mel's just going to talk about basically what we've done so far. OK, so uh, as of November of this year, we uh, have installed 24 shower heads in 23 apartments that serve 23 adults and nine children throughout the Brooklyn area. And uh, so we had like a little issue in terms of like 
what liabilities we might have to deal with. So uh, we were fortunate enough to have uh, people that own real estate, and we asked them if we could use their properties as trial runs to see whether their water bills would go down after a certain period of time. So we installed all these shower heads. Uh, what we went in with was like a little booklet, like a pamphlet, and it was like you got to pick one of these shower heads. You got a rain shower head, a stronger pressure shower head, and the resident was allowed to pick what shower head they wanted. And what we did was we took the water bill for that quarter towards the end of this year, well, end of last year, 2016, and we wanted to see if there was a drop from that last quarter up until this current quarter. And we're still in the process of getting that done. And just quickly touching on some issues, because once you really jump in and start going out and field, a lot of issues pop up. And one thing we realized is first, the water bill is for the whole building, not for the individual apartment. So we found it was very difficult to see how much each family was really saving. Another problem is you don't save as much on the water bill as you do on the electric bill. A lot of the cost comes heating up the water. So it's either through electricity or through gas. So we really, we looked at the bills and we did see a decrease. Now we assume that some of it came from installing the shower heads, but we also realized that people became more aware. Just talking with the tenants and installing the shower heads, they became more conscious of how much water they were using and that made an impact. And so for now, what we've done is we've created a website, um, which you can kind of see here, if I can figure out how to scroll. Oh, there we go. Um, so we kind of just have created an interactive website, and we currently, we don't have a product yet. We're working with an NYU engineer uh, who's uh, working on our design for our own product and shower type, um, and hopefully we can have that ready to go by the summer. Uh, but in the meantime, we've had our website up for a little while now, uh, and we keep making changes to it. We're trying to make it a resource for people to use um, just in case they want to just uh, reduce how much water they're going to save anyway. Uh, here's where our product will go, a uh, little bit of why they should take action, and then how they can contact us. And that's really what we've been up to for the past year. So, yeah, that is it. Uh, next, next up, we have our second place team from last year, uh, the bench, gentlemen. Hey guys, uh, thanks John. Like John said, we are the bench and we came in here last year with a grand idea to start a bi-weekly email newsletter written by us um, that would cover mostly legal aspects of the news, have it be funny, have it geared towards millennials, young practitioners um, as a way to engage people with legal aspects of the news they might not otherwise be compelled to uh, read. So. You know, what we've been doing in the past year isn't exactly what we planned, um, but we still believe that our model in the long run will work out well. Um, we started from a much simpler place uh, with a blog that Mike will tell you a little bit more about. Um, but overall, we're using, uh, we used the past year to do a lot of things. One of them is to just start writing um, and test our product on friends and family and really hone in on the topics we want to cover and our tone of voice and how we present um, our topics. But overall, um, we started slow, haven't sent out an email yet. Um, we're in the form of a blog right now, but based on stuff we've been reading, um, you know, this, this business opportunity is still there and you know, the market for weekly, daily emails um, is definitely something we hope to exploit in the future. <clears throat> Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so, as you can see, this is what the front page looks like right now. We have about 15 to 20 stories up. Uh, we, we're just covering a bunch of different topics uh, from elections and politics uh, to real estate law to uh, administrative law. And uh, we've taken some of the seed money to uh, build a WordPress website. We've purchased a, a subscription with them. And we're trying out a bunch of different uh, layouts for it. And so eventually, like uh, Jeremiah said, we do want to turn this into an email newsletter, but we're just working out the kinks and, and seeing how uh, different stories play out and how we can better formulate uh, our articles to our future readers. 
Uh, so the, again, uh, the year has been fun. Uh, we've learned a ton, right? So uh, it's been interesting as students. Uh, I'm in the two-year program. These guys, we actually all started in the two-year program. Uh, these other guys have extended. So it's been uh, it's it's been a fun it's been a fun experience trying to balance running a, trying to start a business and being in school at the same time. Uh, we've it's obviously been a year where there hasn't been a shortage of stuff to talk about in the political and legal world. So refining what we want to talk about has also been a, has also been a challenge. Um, but one thing we definitely look forward to is just getting better at it, uh, and that's finding our voice, finding the articles that people actually care about. Um, one thing in our business model we look forward to is bringing on guest writers. You know, at the end of the day, we're four white guys, so we need. Uh, other voices to be involved, other uh, other point of views. So that's something that we're really looking forward to doing. Um, and then just trying to figure out who our audience is. At first, we were just targeting uh, the millennial audience. But when we went through this process last year, um, just even the legal community, uh, they were really interested in this. You know, you have, you know, nowadays the, the legal world is so concentrated. And, and so, uh, you know, you, when you're a property lawyer, you only do this property and, and, and securities law, you only do the securities. And they want to be able to talk about, just like you were in law school, you want to be able to talk about everything. So uh, there's been a gap there that's been fun to talk about with practitioners um, that they want to learn about everything, um, constitutional law, everything across the board. So uh, we're looking to hone in on not just our voice, but also the audience. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Andrew, part of the bench, and uh, as Rob was saying before, we've learned a lot this year. Uh, one of the things that we've learned is that it's difficult to balance uh, employing our sense of humor and also trying to achieve, you know, some, uh, to convey what, what uh, the story that we're talking about is all about and also input that legal perspective to keep our readers informed. And while that's been challenging, it's also uh, been a lot of fun. While there could be some possible conflicts with uh, publishing, at, uh, possibly from working for a judge in the future, we also have seen that generating content while being a full-time law student, it, it's pretty tough. And we're looking forward to this summer where uh, we'll have some more free time and be able to keep churning material out. And uh, we've already really started to rapidly start uh, writing more and it's 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 been a great experience and that's really what we've learned and uh, we look forward to honing our craft uh, and 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 last but certainly not least we have last year's winner uh, whose name has changed a couple times in its evolution but it's currently uh, juris AI Great, thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Elise Balaban and I'm co-founder and CEO of Juris AI Inc. We won last year's competition as 3Ls. Unfortunately, my partners couldn't be here. So what is Juris AI? We use natural language processing, machine learning, and algorithmic data image analysis to determine the probability that you will receive a trademark grant. In order to do this, you upload your image into the software system. The image scans the system itself. You can select the different filters, such as jurisdiction, classes of goods and services, and you'll receive a comprehensive report back. So the competition really helped us out by winning it. Not only did it help us out financially, but we were able to meet great future corporate advisors. We got great advice and ideas from the judges themselves, and it actually gave us legitimacy in the market. So financially, we are able to incorporate the company and we could also pay for some of our technological platforms and data management systems. So right now, we have been talking to potential investors that they just want to see the final product. It's still being completed. We've also been talking to potential clients. Um, I've talked to many different law firms. I've talked to technological companies. It's, they're pretty interested. They want to see the product at work, of course. So we started this company actually right before we started taking the bar. So it wasn't the best time to start. It was very frustrating and stressful. So you know, it took a little bit more time to get off the ground than we originally anticipated. Right now, we are currently assessing our options, and we are taking it from there. Thank you.
that concludes uh, the competition today. Uh, we are going to announce the winners, as Phil indicated, at the outset of the panel upstairs, which is uh, going to start in about 30 minutes, the networking reception. Um, everyone is welcome to uh, linger, grab, grab a, a seltzer, and, and head upstairs when they're ready. Uh, there will be full refreshments and beverages upstairs. Everything that could be is sourced from Brooklyn, including all beer and wine, as well as produce. See you all upstairs. Thank you.